step two um, within, so after you've thought, do you even need a vehicle? Then have a look at what is there out there that is outside of the ordinary. This may require challenging the business quite a bit. It may really require telling people, um, you know, th th this type of vehicle you think you don't want, you, you have to have actually. I've, I've looked at the way you run your vehicle and there's no reason why you can't have, for example, an electric vehicle or a plug-in hybrid or something like that. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you the types of vehicles that are sort of out there at the moment and, um, and where you might be able to find them. So if you think, I would say natural gas for example, some parts of Europe that it's, it's entirely unfeasible to, uh, to have a natural gas vehicle, but Italy for example and, and Germany is moving that way, um, there's certainly scope to consider natural gas, uh, confess natural gas as a, as a vehicle fuel. Um, as part of that, you can think about biofuels, um, you know, biogas rather than just natural gas. Um, but certainly in some parts of, of, uh, of Europe, um, biofuels, for example in, in Scandinavia, are really um, taking off. And there's certainly the option to, to consider um, using biofuels rather than, um, than your conventional diesel or, or petrol. Um, and then finally, uh, electric is, is another mode. They're, they're really, they really are there now. There's, they're, they're quite expensive sometimes, but often with finance deals um, and often with the way they procure the vehicle uh, is, is, can be slightly different to how you might procure a conventional vehicle where maybe you lease the battery, you buy the vehicle or, or another arrangement like that. Um, electric vehicles really are there for, for most segments. There'll be an electric vehicle available. Um, with that, you get the range extended um, electric vehicles, the plug-in hybrid electric vehicles that allow you to use a battery a lot of the time. Uh, but then, if that battery is depleted, then there's a, a diesel or petrol motor to either charge the battery or, or run the vehicle directly. So, there are a number of different alternative fuel cars and vans. I'm going to run you through each one in a bit more, more detail um, in a moment, but first, let me, uh, let me tell you about why they're, um, that they're there, why they're being developed and why, why they exist. Really, it's, a, it's one of the success stories of the EU and the legislation that has been brought in by the EU. So, um, in 2015, so this is this year, um, the fleet average of, of all uh, car manufacturers needs to be 130 grams of CO2, um, which is, is generally being achieved. Um, look forward to 2021, and the fleet average needs to be 95 grams CO2. That is for the entire fleet of vehicles. So that obviously means you're going to have some vehicles that are going to be very, very low emission. And then you're going to have some vehicles that are going to be high emission, you know, and they, they, they'll then counter each other out. Um, this is part of the reason why uh, European, particularly car, car production in Europe, in Europe, anyone who does business in Europe really, really has to have some type of zero emission vehicle on the market. Um, because if you're, if you're able to sell a battery electric vehicle, you can count that as a zero emission vehicle, which then allows you to then produce your bigger luxury line uh, vehicles within your, your fleet of vehicles. So for example, uh, Mercedes, they, they may sell many very, very large sedans, um, but then at the same time they're selling some electric vehicles, it allows them to counterbalance those big luxury sedans that are going to have obviously far more CO2 than 95 grams. What that means for procurers is that there are vehicles out there and a lot of the time these people that produce the vehicles, the car companies that produce the vehicles, want to sell them. So you are in a position where potentially you can bargain and you can, you can you know, ma make deals happen. So that don't look at just the list price of these vehicles, not that you would ever anyway, I am sure you're very competent procurers, but really have a think about the list price and how you might be able to get a deal of some sort. Um, vans have a similar type of, uh, of, of standard, uh, 2017 is the first fleet average of 175 grams um, and then by 2020 it's down to 147. So equally they're thinking of electric um, and, and mainly extended or hybrid vehicles as well. Um, yeah, these targets can't be met without electric vehicles or some other form of zero emission vehicle um, and you are then able to reap the rewards there by um, by, by procuring them because they're available and they're going to be probably cheaper than they really should be. So this is gives you an idea of what actually is available right now. So 
If you're thinking about a car, van, obviously petrol, diesel, everyone knows they're available. Um, hybrid vehicles, they're available in most car segments, just straight hybrids, um, without a plug that is. Um, not so much in the van market. Plug-in hybrids, um, they are getting more and more available, um, and this will probably be out of date by the time you read it. Um, there certainly is, um, they're, they're, at the moment it's C and D with the, um, the BMW and the, the, uh, the Volt or the Ampera, um, and then the SUV with the, with the uh, Outlander. And then the main extended ones, they're similar to the plug-in hybrids, um, but they, uh, there's a slightly different uh, formation of, the, of the, uh, the way that the battery powers the wheels and the engine powers the wheels or the battery. Um, but the details of that you don't particularly need to know for your purposes. Um, they're not really available, neither of them are available as a van at present. Um, electric vans are, are actually available, um, but they're only available as small vans, so the N1 class, so you're looking at the ENV200 or the Kangoo. There are some aftermarket conversions available, but um, they're not OEM and they are um, you know, perfectly legitimate vehicles to be looking at procuring, but um, yeah, I, there's certainly no big OEM big vehicles. Um, electric cars all over the place. Um, generally, there's, there's an electric vehicle for most segment you might be interested in. Um, gas, biofuels, um, available in some countries. It really is country specific rather than vehicle type specific. If the, if the infrastructure's there, then obviously it's there. Or if you're running a depot and you, you uh, refuel all your vehicles from your depot, there are cases that um, biogas, for example, in the UK that has very little infrastructure um, does actually get used, particularly in the van segment, where people um, operate a back-to-base model where the van is based in a depot. That depot has a biogas refueling um, infrastructure built into the depot and then the van does its route and, and goes back each evening and, and gets its gas again. Um, hydrogen, just I mean it's available but it's just prohibitively expensive at the moment. Um, so in the sh and, and the infrastructure really isn't there, but you know, in the longer term, it might be something um, you have to keep your eye on. So general rules. This is very much a general rules for petrol and diesel. Um, diesel vehicles are cheaper than petrol vehicles um, over their lifetime. Uh, petrol vehicles sometimes be a bit cheaper to buy. Um, a petrol vehicle produces more CO2 than a diesel vehicle. However, a petrol vehicle also um, will produce less air quality associated emissions, so that's the PM10 and the, and the NO2. Um, as you can see by those, those handy stats for Ford Focus. Um, petrol vehicles really are more suited to urban driving. Um, stop starts and obviously within the area that's probably going to be stressed with, with air quality issues anyway, whereas a diesel vehicle is far more suited to motorway driving um, at, a, at a consistent speed, not stop start. Um, and not in an area that has an air quality um, issue. Um, hybrid vehicles, there's actually not a huge difference between a standard hybrid vehicle and an internal combustion engine vehicle. Um, there is, obviously, uh, the, if it's doing a lot of stop-start in a city environment, you know, a taxi is a really good example. Um, having a Toyota Prius, for example, makes a lot of sense. But a lot of the time, if you're on the motorway all of the time, for example, all you're really doing is carrying a very heavy battery with you um, and, and the savings aren't really there if you were to just buy a, uh, a, a conventional internal combustion engine vehicle. The second thing to say on that is if, for example, you're just carrying one person, very little luggage, and they're driving around you know, many hours a day, there's, what, why would you buy a big Prius or another plug-in hybrid that's larger, why wouldn't you just buy a very small vehicle, you know, re really a real mini, super mini type vehicle, and the CO2 um, associated with the super mini is normally less than a Prius, um, because they're smaller vehicles, and so, you know, something to consider there. Don't just buy a Prius because it's a plug-in or, or any other type of plug-in hybrid. Um, consider what the vehicle actually is required for. Does it need to be that big, essentially? So the general rules for an electric vehicle. Now, these obviously run exclusively on electricity. Um, mostly you can get 160 kilometers, that's, that's the sort of seems to be a benchmark unless you're going for a really high-end vehicle, um, you know, 100 miles or so. 
However, in my experience, and I you know, by no means take this on, on, on uh, take this as a, as a rule, but rule of thumb would be between 60 and 70 percent of what is advertised is what is safely doable. Um, this is because if you're running at night and you've got your windscreen wipers and your headlights on, you've got the heaters on, for example, obviously that's going to take more power from the battery, so you might not be able to run the full 100, um, 100 miles or 160 kilometres. So it's worth, worth considering that when, uh, when looking at purchasing these vehicles. Um, but to saying that, it's very rare that a vehicle, particularly in an urban um, urban environment will do many more mile, many more kilometres than you know, 50 kilometres maybe in a day if you're lucky. Um, so they work very well as pool vehicles because obviously if you go and choose which vehicle you're going to drive that then you've got a choice of 10 vehicles and three of them are electric and three of them are plug-in hybrids and, and, and four of them are, are normal conventional vehicles then that allows you to then have that choice and use the, the suitable vehicle for the job. Um, so things about how, the, how these vehicles work Obviously the battery is a major cost in the vehicle, that's why they're often more expensive than their internal combustion engine counterparts. So often you will either lease the battery, sometimes they won't even sell you the battery in the first place. So you'll lease the battery or you'll lease the entire vehicle, that de-risks it for you. Um, because obviously A, you're not paying for the, for, for the battery up front, and secondly, and it's uh, over instalments, and secondly, if that, that battery ever has an issue with it, then it's not your issue, it's the OEM's issue, they will then replace that battery for you. Um, and so it, sort of, it make, makes the cost of the vehicle more palatable and the risk of the vehicle more palatable. Um, one thing is really key, and in, in my experience we've had issues with, is when you get back with an electric vehicle it's so important to ensure that your operator is plugging that vehicle straight in. and. Um, you know, if, if, you know, otherwise you're going to come the next day and it's going to be empty for the next person that needs to use it. Um, so yeah, use it as a pool car, but if you are going to use it as a pool car, it's quite important to have a mechanism in place, I guess, to force people to use it, rather than just going and getting into the internal combustion engine vehicle they're used to. So it's having some kind of hierarchy there where if that person's job or that, that, that person's role that day means they can use an electric vehicle so they're doing less than 100 kilometres, um, then they have to use it and they can only use the combustion engine vehicle if they're e either there's no electric vehicle available or because the um, you know they're, 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 they yeah they have to use it essentially. Um, so most charging is likely to happen at home, wherever home is, that may be the depot or it may be the, um, the, per the, the operator's home. Um, if you are going to do daytime um, charging during the day where you top the vehicle up because it's doing many more than that 100 um, kilometres, then it's quite important to think about the, um, the implications that will have on your grid, uh, on the electricity grid in, in, in the area or the electricity coming into the, the depot or, or home. Because A, if you're using fast charging, it's sometimes difficult to fast charge more than one or two vehicles, and depending on, on the quality of the grid around where your depot is. Um, and secondly, if you're thinking about charging more than, say, five or six vehicles in one go, again, there's going to be big issues with the, the implications on the grid there are going to be quite significant. Um, secondly, again, this is my view, um, the charging grids in most countries in the EU aren't really uh, reliable enough to, um, to be able to base uh, an operation on. Um, so although it may be advertised that there's charging infrastructure at service stations between cities, either they, they're being used or sometimes they're out of action. Estonia is an exception to that, they've got a very, very good fast charging network and many other countries are, are really close on the coattails and there are EU um, uh, requirements for countries to have good charging infrastructure by 2020, so um, you know, it's, it's not long before most countries in the EU will have a good charging infrastructure, but at present, something just to be aware of. Um, so hybrid and range extended. Now, these, these have a, a rechargeable battery as well as an engine, and either the engine charges the battery or it runs the, end, runs the vehicle itself, or, or a mixture of the two. Um, they, they can be used in exclusively electric vehicle mode, 
um, and the, the, the engine only then cuts in very occasionally if it really needs to. Um, if that is happening though, you've got a question, why haven't you just got an electric vehicle? There's obviously cost implications and weight implications of having a, a motor on there as well. So if the vehicle really is um, just running in electric mode all the time, then, then you might as well just get an electric vehicle. However, if it really is using them both, um, then it can be a really effective solution and save quite a lot of money actually. Um, at the moment, a plug-in hybrid looks you know, about 15 kilometers for most of them. There are some that are a lot greater than that. Um, equally, for a range extended vehicle, um, anywhere between about 40 kilometers and, and up to 160 kilometers for some of them. Um, so this means that you can run an electric only mode for a, a lot of your journey. You only need a diesel or petrol engine you know, very, very occasionally, or if you're doing that long trip, uh, maybe once or twice a week. Um, so yeah, they are more, more expensive than an ICE, uh, internal combustion engine vehicle, um, and they're not always appropriate. So you've got to think, is, is this be is a vehicle that's going to be used on a motorway going to do 150 miles every day, 200 miles every day, so 300 plus kilometers each day, um, is that vehicle really, does it, is it appropriate for that vehicle to be a plug-in hybrid or a range extended? Um, potentially a diesel vehicle might be a better option there. But if it's in an urban context, if it's doing you know, less than 100 or so, um, or somewhere in the region of 100 kilometers or a bit more than that, then yeah, that is potentially the vehicle for you, something to think about. Again, operators have to be trained to plug the vehicle in when they get home. Otherwise, the next day, um, the implications can be even worse because if they're not being plugged in, it's only in running on the engine. That means all the money you spent on a big battery to go in that vehicle is is wasted because the battery is not being used and the savings associated with that aren't being made. Um, yeah, so you just have a think. Potentially, yeah, um, electric vehicle or, or a, a standard internal combustion engine vehicle could be more suitable, but there certainly is a place for these vehicles. Um, so your gas, biofuel vehicles, very similar to an ICE vehicle, it's really important you think about how you're going to fuel that vehicle. Because um, if you're refueling it with, you know, if, if there is an infrastructure, obviously you can't use it, and you've got to think about where the, um, where, where, where the biofuel is coming from. I mean, generally that's not something for you to consider, because there are rules in place now within the EU to ensure that it's not taken off um, you know, uh, food lands designed designated for, for producing food. Um, but yeah, most countries don't really have the the infrastructure available for, for, for cars and vans unless you have a depot where that vehicle is based and can be refueled, or you're in one of the countries in the EU that has a good network like Italy. Um, so generally, just a general rule for all alternative fuel vehicles, there are subsidies out there. Um, often government level subsidies in, in the UK for example, there's um, Office of Low Emission Vehicles will uh, give you 20% off the cost price of the vehicle, um, up to £5,000. Um, consider leasing and purchasing, uh, different countries, different vehicles, different days will mean that they, um, that, that they can be very different pricing um, over your four year or, or three and a half, four year period that you might own the vehicle for or use the vehicle for. Um, it's worth looking at both, even if you're usually only ever lease, look at purchasing and vice versa. Um, and also play them off against each other to some extent because this is a new market and there are, a lot of these vehicles are being produced and not always being, being sold. So deals are there to be done. Um, another thing you're going to probably have to do within your authority, you know, you're just the procurement guy, you need to then engage with not just the people who want, the person who wants to drive that vehicle and to request that vehicle, but whatever funding mechanism goes into paying for that vehicle. Because, particularly with a battery electric vehicle, you are purchasing essentially four years worth of fuel because you're purchasing a very expensive battery. And so that means that the fuel costs are going to be dramatically reduced because you, know, you might spend a few pence, a few euro cent on electricity a day, whereas you were used to be spending you know, many euros on on, uh, on, on diesel or petrol. So if you're changing that, then you need to then somehow find a way of, of, of charging them maybe a bit more for the vehicle, but explaining them that they'll have savings in the operation, or somehow crawling back that money that they're, that they're, they're saving, so that they understand that the vehicle that they're buying is, um, is actually not as expensive as they maybe think it is. Um, 
not just a ticket ticket price to look at. Um, yeah, you might also have to challenge the vehicle operation system. So, for example, ensuring that um, operators plug in the vehicle, or ensuring that um, the or introducing some kind of pool vehicle system where someone doesn't have the vehicle, same vehicle each day. Um, the vehicle is, is given to them based on what they need to use it for that day. Um, and also, alternative fuel vehicles, it's no use having a battery electric vehicle and then only driving it 10 kilometres a day or 5 kilometres a day because you're not going to have the savings that you, that you require to make it cost effective. It needs to be driven, you know, probably about 30 to 50 kilometres. Again, don't take those as red, that's just a general rule of thumb as it were. They need to be driven a fair bit each day to ensure that the savings that you're getting um, from buying that battery are then realised by using that battery on a daily basis.